Greetings to everyone who's joining us, either by the live stream or by replay later. Good to have you here. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us and for the chance we have to share lessons from your word about you and your goodness today. In Jesus' name, amen. My wife and I are very glad for modern medicine. If it weren't for that, uh, Carol probably would have been dead several times over by now. Uh, and so we have appreciated what modern medicine can do for us. In the ancient days where they didn't have the options that we have now, a lot of things that we don't particularly fear now were bad news back then. And of all the things that could happen to you, probably the most dreaded was leprosy. It was a slow death. As the body deteriorated, it's deadly, it's incurable, it's contagious. It led to being cut off from society and family. It desensitizes the person who has it to its presence. There's a loss of senses in the nerves. You don't feel the destruction of your body but it nevertheless is slowly sapping away your life, progressively destroying your body and you, until finally it kills you. Sin's a lot like that, you know. And leprosy became a symbol of sin, even in the minds of people in ancient biblical days. Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 Talk about leprosy. Chapter 13 talks about how you diagnose leprosy. Chapter 14 talks about something else, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Chapter 13 of Leviticus, verses 2 and 3. When a man has a skin, has on the skin of his body a swelling, a scab, or a bright spot, and it becomes on the skin of his body like a leprous sore, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons the priests. The priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body. And if the hair of the sore has turned white and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous sore. Then the priest shall examine him and pronounce him unclean. It continues with further details of, of diagnosis and exceptions and the things that look like leprosy but are not. Uh, and then in verse 45 and 46, what do you do when you have leprosy? Now the leper upon whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean, all the days that he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Two things in there, God says, you need to do when someone has leprosy. We might recognize those two things at this point in the coronavirus uh, pandemic that we're facing. The two things were separation from other people and covering your face. It turns out that at this point, we have now figured out those are the two most useful things we can do as a society to slow or stop the spread of the coronavirus. Separate so it can't transmit and cover the face, which also restricts transmission. In a day before modern medicine, there was no hope of a cure for them. Those were the only things they could do. Now chapter 14 goes on. Uh, I'm going to begin with verse 2. This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And if, indeed, if the leper is healed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him 
who is to be cleansed, two living and clean birds, cedarwood, scarlet, and hyssop. There is a ceremony for the ritual cleansing of the person who is cured of leprosy. When I first caught sight of that in scripture, I thought that that's kind of odd, isn't it? You have a ceremony for the cleansing of someone who is cured of the incurable. Uh, the, the point of that? Why do we have a ceremony to certify the cure of an incurable disease? I think that it is built in to the ceremonies as a prophecy. A prophecy that says, although this disease is incurable, there will be one who comes who can cure it. And when he does, you will want this ceremony to use at that moment. So here it is. When you finally need it, it's here. It's been here all along. The, one of the birds is killed and his blood caught in an earthen vessel. This is done over running water. And then the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop are dipped in the blood and the live bird also is dipped in the blood. Uh, and then the blood is sprinkled on the one who has been cured of leprosy and the live bird is let go. Then he waits seven days if everything is still good, and he shaves off all his hair, on the eighth day, verse 10, he shall take two male lambs without blemish, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, and one log of oil. The three lambs for sacrifices uh, caught my attention also. Uh, there was a trespass offering. There was a sin offering. And there was a burnt offering. Now, I'm not an expert on the offerings of the ancient Judaic system. Uh, and the differences between the different offerings are not completely clear to me. But they were different offerings with slightly different rituals and slightly different reasons for using them. And it starts out with the trespass offering. And the blood from the trespass offering is then caught. And some of it is placed on the right ear of the person who had leprosy, his right thumb, and his right big toe. Then you also do the same with oil, the right ear, the right thumb, the right big toe. And you offer all three of these lambs as separate sacrifices. I got curious about that, and I don't have a definitive answer. But I have a suspicion at what it's driving at. Because leprosy became a symbol of sin, The cure of leprosy represents the cure of sin. And each of the sacrifices also represents the cure of sin, how sin is resolved in our lives. And of course, the sacrifice animals all represent Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in this particular case, and I'm not familiar with any other that requires multiple sacrifices of different kinds for the same event. But here, they're all pulled in because they all represent the cleansing of sin and leprosy is kind of the ultimate symbol of sin. So they all come together for the one who is cured of leprosy. 
the, the ceremony with the two birds. Out of the blood of the dead bird, the living bird goes free. And for us, being dipped in the blood of Jesus' death, the repentant sinner goes free. Mark chapter 1. I'm going to flip over to where we find the fulfillment, or at least one of the fulfillments, of why there was ever such a ceremony in the first place. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 40. Now a leper came to him, that is to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Now for context, we need to remember that there has not been a recorded cure of a leper in the scripture since Naaman was cured by Elisha in the Old Testament days. None since then. And, and Jesus elsewhere speaking about that said, there was plenty of lepers in, in Israel. There were plenty of widows in Israel. But God sent e Elijah to a, a foreign widow and a foreign official was cured of his leprosy because they were open to receive God's blessing. Here, a leper comes to Jesus. The, the lepers have heard about Jesus. They live in their own little societies off on the edges of, of main society. And they've seen that Jesus heals every kind of disease with ease, with a word, with a touch. But the question remains for them whether he would be willing to heal them. And this particular leper, when he comes to Jesus, he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He has concluded that Jesus' power is sufficient to cure leprosy. Jesus can do this, but would he want to? The Pharisees and the scribes have assured the leper that he is under God's judgment for his sin and that it is a punishment that God has sent, which he rightfully deserves, uh, and they wouldn't cure him if they could. <laughs> no, you are evil, and that's why this has come. We won't interfere with the judgment God has sent to you. And thus his question about the willingness. Would Jesus think it appropriate or inappropriate to cure him of his leprosy? He knows he has the power. He's just not sure if Jesus would think he should. Is it appropriate for him to do that? And so he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed, be cleansed. Notice Jesus doesn't just say, you're cleansed. He says, I am willing. And he answers, I think, maybe even a more important question than can you when he says, yes, I am willing. You asked if I was willing. And the answer is, absolutely, I am willing. Absolutely, I am. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, 
and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Jesus told him not to tell anyone about it, which didn't make any sense to the leper. The power of God has been shown in great measure. Why would you not rejoice and share that good news? Well, the result was Jesus couldn't go into the towns anymore for some time because he had touched a leper. And his enemies could say, according to the law of Moses, having touched a leper, he is now considered unclean. So he can't come into the towns. And they used it as an excuse to hinder Jesus' ministry. But there was another thing that was happening here. Jesus says, go to the priests and offer the things that Moses commanded. One of the accusations against Jesus was that he didn't go by the rules Moses gave. He's a free spirit and he just doesn't do what he's supposed to do. That wasn't really true but it was an accusation that they could get a little bit of traction out of now and then. And so that was always being rumbled about uh, toward Jesus. He just doesn't follow the rules that Moses gave us. But here he very carefully says to this guy, be sure to do everything Moses said as, as a testimony that Jesus is not really fighting Moses. Jesus and Moses are not on different pages. They are not trying to accomplish different things. They do not disagree, actually. They are in agreement. And then he says, do all this as a testimony to them. The them is the priests, the ones who examine you and pronounce you unclean, the ones who re-examine you and pronounce you clean. The priests and the leaders of the of Israel were not very open to Jesus. Very, very few of them showed any uh, openness toward him at all during his ministry. And Jesus was wanting to give them evidence that would speak to their hearts and get past their defenses. And when a leper whom they had pronounced unclean, was brought back to the same priests, and they pronounced him clean, and went through all the ceremonies that Moses had prescribed at the beginning of the seven days, at the end of the seven days, all of the sacrifices as well. As they worked through all of that, they are reminded that they are looking at one who has just been cured of an incurable disease. And they have to be thinking, somebody out there is curing lepers. There is somebody in our midst who can do that and is doing that. They had to break out the cleansing ceremony Recorded by Moses, it presumably wasn't used for Naaman, the last leper to be cured. He wasn't an Israelite and wouldn't have followed the Mosaic rules about it. He just went home to Syria where he had come from. But now they get to break out that cleansing ceremony. And this is the moment which God gave it to you for. It's been there all along for this moment. There is someone here who is cleansing lepers. It didn't seem to make much difference to the priests at that moment. They all went about their duties as before. Some of them saw what it meant, but turned away from the light. Others saw what it meant and quietly treasured that light in their hearts. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. 
after the church chose the seven deacons and prospered greatly. Verse 7, then the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. A great company of the priests came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And the leper who was first cured and sent to them to go through that ceremony with them was one of the first seeds planted in the hearts of many of those priests. In many ways, sin is much like leprosy. It is deadly, and to us it is incurable. Uh, it is contagious, or can be, and one who has it is cut off from the society of heaven and the rest of the universe. Our whole world is cut off from the rest of the universe because of sin. Sin also leads to a loss of senses spiritually so that we don't feel the destruction that is happening within us because of sin. And it slowly saps away our life as it progressively destroys the one who has been caught up in sin. But that ceremonial cleansing of the leper teaches us some things. One is the day will come that you will need this ceremony. There will be those cured of that which is of itself incurable because there will be one who comes who can cure the lepers and he is the one who also cures sin. When Jesus touched the leper, his opponents said, aha, he's unclean. Because according to the rules of Moses, if you touch a leper, you become contaminated, you become unclean by contact with the one who is contagious. You have picked up some of that contagion. But was Jesus really contaminated by touching the leper? His touch drove the leprosy out of the leper. He had power over leprosy, not leprosy having power over him. And in his case, he could touch the leper and not be contaminated because he dominated the leprosy, not the leprosy dominating him. And so the cleansing of the leper and the ceremony that goes with it, uh, I, I find it very interesting that the Bible included that, that God told Israel about it. The ceremony for the, for the verification and the authentication of a cure of the incurable meant that God intended that there would be a cure that would come and you would need to use this ceremony when the one came who could heal the lepers. That's Jesus, the one who heals us of sin. As the bird, out of the blood of the dead bird, the living bird was set free. So out of the blood of the one that died, we also are set free. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you are the one who has power over sin and over every disease that has ever been known or ever will be known. That you are the master of all things. Lord, bring the healing into our lives that we need, both physically, but especially spiritually. Thank you for being our great healer. In Jesus' name, amen.